Monsieur le Président de la République de Croatie. Mr. President of the Republic of Croatia, Mr. President of the Swiss Confederation, former Federal Councillor, Madame Calmire, Excellencies, distinguished members of the Grand Council, the Geneva Cantonal Parliament, distinguished representatives of the Croatian delegation, dear students, dear colleagues, dear guests, dear friends. President Zoran Milanovic, President Ignacio Cassis, you have chosen to mark this official visit by a dialogue with the students of Geneva University, and we're extremely grateful to you for having done so. Peace and a spirit of cooperation must never be taken for granted, and they must constantly be furthered by generation after generation. We're also honored to be able to host this event in a seat of learning, research, and above all, dialogue. To analyze, to interpret, to understand, and dialogue are at the very heart of the mission of this university. And it's also one of the vocations of the city of Geneva. Geneva is a university city, an international city. It is a, a place which is conducive to dialogue, to advancement of knowledge, to scientific progress, and dialogue and interchange between cultures. All these are key elements when it comes to reducing ignorance, fear, hostility, polarization, all of which sadly are so widespread today, indeed perhaps even more so than in the past. Geneva and its university are also engaged with the Confederation, the Swiss Confederation, to contribute to its policy of neutrality and good offices. May I express the wish that all of us, all generations, may work together towards a sustainable and serene future, one which is built on the pillars of an enlightened policy of peace and security. This afternoon's dialogue will be moderated by Madame Micheline Calmire in November 2011, one month before Croatia signed the Treaty of Accession to the European Union. Madame Calmire was the first president of the Swiss Confederation to go on an official visit to Zagreb, the capital of Croatia. The students of the Global Studies Institute of the University of Geneva will also take part in the dialogue on the podium, and we will conclude by a brief question and answer session with everyone in the room. Without any further ado, Mr. President of the Republic of Croatia, Mr. President of the Swiss Confederation, Madame Calmire, Madame Alexander, Madame Reva, Mr. Dubinsky, Mr. Vauchier, I have the pleasure of inviting you all up to the podium for this dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor of moderating this dialogue between the two presidents, a dialogue which President Cassis asked us to organize. It's being organized by the university. We'll begin with an exchange between the president of Croatia, Zoran Milanovic, and the Swiss president, Ignacio Cassis. They will speak French and English. And this discussion initially will also involve students who are up here on the podium with us, Leticia Alexander, Dimitro Krolinski, Clément Le Vauchier, and Ilam Reva. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, the European continent is beset by a war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine. President Milanovic is well familiar with security issues in Europe. Since in 1996, he was a councillor to the European Union and NATO as a member of the Croatian delegation to Brussels. And in 1999, he was responsible in the Croatian government for relations with NATO. So it is as president of Croatia that on the 24th of March 2022, he attended the extraordinary NATO summit. That's just one month after the invasion of Ukraine. The new balance which is shaping up in Europe around the European Union and NATO 
is of particular importance for the most recent members, and that's the case of Croatia. President Milanovic, today the Russian president, is forcing the United States to once again get involved on the European front. But uh, caution is of the essence. It can, there can be no question of a direct confrontation between the Russian Federation and the West. The aim is to contain, limit the conflict to the territory of Ukraine and let Ukraine fight on its own against Russia. The United States presence on the old continent is less visible today than it was in the past. How do you evaluate, assess your security within NATO, Mr. President? Uh, first and foremost, hello everybody. I'm thrilled to see such a large audience. It hasn't been a while. Now, straight to the, to the answers. Uh, you, well, it was quite audacious, audacious definition of the American position as being dragged into as if there is a kind of proxy war. Uh, it's a war of the weaker country which has been attacked by the stronger country and the uh, fundamental uh, sense of fair play, whoever played sports should be familiar, who hasn't should draw that from the experience of the upbringing Christian upbringing. So that essential, uh, essential viewpoint asks you to support the weaker side. In this case, this is Ukraine, without buts or ifs. Uh, Russia is a very, very huge, dangerous, and uh, complex beast. Deranged in its demeanor, but indestructible, indestructible, indestructible physically. And when we ponder Russia, I do not have the same expectations from Russia as I might have, or actually as I do have, from, say, Germany, or in particular Germany, or the United States, because simply I do not measure them by the same yardstick. So your question, your very question was about whether Ukraine is confined to fighting on its ground. My very question is, are you in security inside the NATO? Are we in security? Well, of course we are. We are not we Eastern. Think it's enough. No, no, no. We are. And and uh, since you wrote on the neutrality on Switzerland, and actually I was handed over your book, but the time was uh, insufficient to to yes. get through it all. Uh, I would tell you that the neutrality would be the most uh, splendid position any country, not a splendid isolation of the British type. So the most splendid and the most desirable position any country could have. But simply and bluntly, we cannot afford that. So we are in NATO just because of the Americans. That's not exactly community of values, because the values, they differ. They differ among member states. Hungary, Poland, Turkey, Croatia, the Netherlands. Actually, the core teachings of democracy in those countries, they do not coincide, they differ. But what is common is American nuclear umbrella, full stop. That's where I feel better. We had a t terrible experience of war with Serbia. We were attacked. We were almost mutilated. There was a lot of atrocities in that war. Atrocities, so not just shelling, bombing, destruction, you know, sheer damage, but atrocities, neighbor on neighbor. And simply, Croats embraced an opportunity to be NATO members. And uh, I don't expect uh, perfection of NATO, yeah. just protection. It's like insurance check. That's it. So, and I will stop here. I'm Atlantic realist, you know. I have another question. I'm, I'm Atlantic realist uh, in the mold of guys like Marshheimer that are being despised by uh, uh, international moralists or cosmopolitan moralists. Well, I was more of a cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan moralist when I was a party leader of the Social Democratic Party of Croatia, which was left-leaning, left-wing, labor, liberal. But I am the president of the republic, so I have a different uh, query to preach. That's my job. <laughs> Thank you. I have another question for you. 
Monsieur le Président, Mr. Les President, the German and Austrian chancellors have seen the impact that the Russian invasion in Ukraine has had on especially the neighbors in the Western Balkans and are asking the European Union to speed up negotiations for North Macedonia and Albania to become members of the EU. You, as Croatia, you're members of both the European Union and NATO, but you're also neighbors of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo, and Montenegro, who are all, all fear for their own security. They're vulnerable. They're vulnerable states. And the, it's not likely that they would become members of NATO or the European Union before a decade or so. Do you think, Mr. President, that it would be possible to consider triggering a process within the European Union and within NATO, come to a common position on the security of these countries, which are neighbors? Among the, 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 the plenitude of the mediocre platitudes that one can use in the academic discourse, I like one the best. Thank you for a question. <laughs> so really thank you for a question because this is something that, that I sometimes want to speak a lot about. But, well, let me start with this. There was a NATO summit the other day. And I'm disclosing this because this is really not confidential. I mean, I'm, I'm representative of the state and it was not that we discussed security matters. So I was uh, 25th. In the, in the roll call, in the line of discussion, uh, discretionary uh, line by the Secretary General. So I sp spoke 25th out of 30. So you would agree that 25 out of 30, you've heard a lot before. You've heard the topics, you've heard the platitudes, you've heard the stereotypes, you've heard the obligatory figure skating figures, you know, the things that everybody repeats. And I listened to, of course, chastising and criticizing and attacking Russia for millions of reasons, uh, concerns of this and that kind. Concern for the security of the partner countries, partner standing for partnership for peace. Georgia, which in my view should not be encouraged to join NATO. It could be detrimental and, and vicious for the country. Moldova, which happened to declare unilateral neutrality the other day. And Bosnia, being exposed to Bosnia-Herzegovina to the malign Russian influence, whatever that is. And whatever the angle is, because the Serbs, they love Russians. So they're certainly under half of Bosnia. They don't think that they're exposed to the malign interest. They might be this or that, but that's not their official position. But then, you know, there is something missing in the picture. Like that uh, proverbial elephant in the room, originally by the Ivan Krilov, Russian tale writer and, and, and novelist. There is an elephant, actually there is elephant and a rhino in the room, and that's Serbia and Kosovo. Nobody, nobody out of 25 leaders of NATO member states considered even mentioning those two countries as, say, Serbia, being really exposed to the malign Russian influence, or being just self-delusional in, in, in ill-recognizing real France. Because for Russia, you know, a monster, and this, this monster has many dimensions. Its size, its resources, its politics, its everything. That, that nothing but a blurred footnote in Russian agenda. And they're deluding themselves that Russians actually are in love with them. They're not. They forgot of them. The first bullet was shot, they forgot about Serbia. So Serbia is a, is, is a crossroads, as a crossroads of magnitude, of sorts whether they will continue their negotiations with the EU. By the way, we mentioned Macedonia, or North Macedonia, not to affront Greek, and Albania, who are just to start those talks. Serbia started them years ago. Yes. They go way back, and they're the, the stuck. And nobody mentioned that country. Another one is Kosovo, yeah. Albanian citizens' republic consisting mostly of ethnic Albanians, of whom many are your competitors in Switzerland. Whatever happened to the track record of the recognition of that republic? Whatever happened? I mean, four NATO members haven't recognized yet. Do you really want that to be repeated in the heart of the Balkans? Because Serbia and Bosnia and, and Kosovo are not a flank, eastern flank countries. They are core countries. They are Croatian neighbors. 
and so on and so forth. So I see that as a misreading of priorities. Serbia's priority. So this should be addressed directly. You want to join? You want to be a member of the West? You know what a West stands for? West does not necessarily stand for the type of democracy Switzerland has, cut and paste, or Netherlands has, or, or Denmark for that matter has. There is also Poland, there is also Hungary, who just won herself another new old prime minister, and it was will of the people. It was not design, it was will of the people. Serbia, time and again, President Vucic wins. So actually, I extended my greetings to them. They're not villains. There might be inconvenience, but they're my neighbors. I have to work with them, I have to live with them. They're not perfect. Croatia is a sort of democracy. Free press, very bad one, but free. <laughs> no, it is, I mean, look, people, I don't know how many of you will, 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 will join that, that path and trajectory in life, but just don't be those journalists who were admitted because they would take anybody. So be the best, be the best. And in Croatian journalism, you see very few of that. But they are not dirigist, yeah. they're not directed, you know, they're, they're, they're not missile directed. And again, thank you for a question, not to, not to consume more of your time, but this, <laughs> is, this is the question, because Russian Milan influence all over the place. What about Serbia? Because NATO bombed Serbia, yes. because Serbs harbor a deep rancor, not to say hatred of NATO, Belgrade was bombed, but I'm not a Serb, I'm Croatian president. Yes. But I'm trying to, 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 for a moment, you know, even though it's not the most sanitary measure, to, to put their shoes on. Yeah. And everybody should do that from time to time. Thank you. All it sanitary is, yeah. standards respected, huh? Uh, Mr. President. No, it's okay. It's... Uh, Mr. President uh, Zoran Milanovic, Mrs. Kalmi Ray. Monsieur le Président de la Confédération, euh, merci infiniment de nous recevoir, euh, nous quatre étudiants. Nous sommes honorés de représenter le corps euh, estudiantin. Uh, I have now a question for you, Mena um, How do you explain the lack of trade agreements between Russia and the European Union? Is Ukraine paying for past and present tensions between Russia and the United States? Uh. You're again asking me whether this is a proxy war. Well, this is not a topic here. It's Ukraine has been attacked by Russia. There are 250,000, to say the least, young males in Russia who are willing, ready, and poised to attack at the order of one man. Professional, patriotic mercenaries. They, they, they're receiving paycheck. They're on the paycheck. No, no other European country has that. That's dangerous. That's the most horrid element of all, because the war is being won on the ground by the boot, not by the King Jals and, and stuff like that, and, and the hypersonics, even though they are quite dangerous. But uh, you ask me about the trade agreement. Well, I'm certain you're, you're being taught in, the, in, the, in, those, in that field, in those lessons about the free trade and the fair trade, and to what extent the country should expose herself to the all vicissitudes and, 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 and horrors of the free market, it can hurt. And uh, it was first uh, that Asian economies, uh, for, for, for the most part China still today, adopted a very protective trade policy, which means being selfish. That's in the core teaching of every nation, being selfish. Not mean, not malicious, but selfish. And they're being selfish. They're protecting their resources because they're not competitive enough. In the, air, in, the, in the commodities and products, they are really competitive. They are by all hearts for the free market. But Russia simply could not sustain, could not sustain the free competition with the European market. On the other hand, resource-wise, resource extraction-wise, they're indestructible. They can blackmail. They're producing and exporting uh, Tremendous amount of calories, cereals, their breadbasket, they will never suffer hunger. But they will never become democracy either. So the reason why it never came to pass, because the Russians didn't like it. 
Europe would do it immediately because Europe can survive that. But all these, you know, uh, trials of sanctions, sanctions starting with Crimea, an action of Crimea 2014, that one enabled Russia to develop considerable, considerable agro-industrial complex of her own, which was not there before. These days, they will have to resort to their own devices, and they will, they will survive this, unfortunately. I've just, you know, watched this morning Russians rejoicing at the news from the Russian Moscow stock market after prolapse of ruble to dollar, it came back to 75 to dollar. So it's even worse than if it had been stable, ostensibly stable, you know, and nervous tense for, for weeks. It first like collapsed, seemingly collapsed, now it returned. It only emboldens the bully and gives the impression that you can continue what you have been doing. And that's exactly the, the, the feeling, because we've been dealing with, with bullies in Croatia, but with, with much less sinister bullies. Because after all, Serbs, Croats, we're small nations, limited resources, and Russia, Russia is endless in its intentions that cannot be read, because this came as a surprise. But to end, hundreds of thousands of young professional soldiers under Russian flag, willing to strike, poised to strike, to cross the border, to die for the country. Europe doesn't know that anymore. So if Germany raised its defense budget to 100 million euro, which is huge money, then it's not only about money, but the, of, of streamlining that money. It can be easily wasted. 100 million, Russian is 80 million, purchasing power parity, it's a more the bug goes further in Russia, but Russians have uh, patriotic mercenaries. That's dangerous. Germans cannot assemble that because they are more, if I say civilized, Russians would take that as an affront, but they are further. Huh? Thank you. Um, Monsieur le Président, la guerre en Ukraine marque the war in Ukraine is uh, also having an impact on Switzerland's neutrality policy with the speed and the number of sanctions that have been imposed by Switzerland on the Russian Federation. This is an issue which uh, men and women in Switzerland are concerned about, and I'm sure you in the audience here are also thinking about Switzerland's neutrality. There have been heated discussions within Switzerland about this uh, subject, but what's interesting is to note that uh, neutrality is also being discussed between the Russian and Ukrainian delegations when they meet to try and uh, come to a settlement over this war. President Cassie, Switzerland condemns the invasion of Ukraine, sees it as a violation of international law. Switzerland imposes stringent sanctions, aligns itself with the European sanctions, and through you, Switzerland expresses its compassion for Ukraine. Mr. President, is Switzerland still neutral? In view of the escalating horror of atrocities we've seen in recent days, do you believe, Mr. President, that Switzerland will be able to completely stay out of this war? Thank you very much. Madam, distinguished members, ladies and gentlemen, and dear students, first of all, let me thank the authorities of the university for allowing us to hold this dialogue here, which is uh, very important. It's first presidential meetings happen all the time, but this is the first time that we've actually taken time to discuss what's going on on the planet with young students. Yes, Switzerland is neutral. Its neutrality has lasted for about four centuries. It was consolidated in the 19th or 20th century. Switzerland has been neutral for centuries and will remain neutral. Neutrality is part of uh, our law. There is also an element of mythology. There's also an element of identity in Switzerland's neutrality. You can really say that neutrality is what makes Switzerland Switzerland. It's really difficult to imagine a non-neutral Switzerland. But non-neutral does not mean indifferent or not having values. 
Oh, it doesn't mean we don't hear or see or speak. Neutrality simply means that we do not take part in an armed conflict, that we're not part of any military alliance, be it NATO or any other one. Neutrality also means that we do not supply war material to either of the belligerents, even if one happens to put support one side. If you're neutral, you don't take part in military activity. So it's a legal and military neutrality. It's not a neutrality of mind or a neutrality of values. Our values are by no means neutral. We have our values enshrined in the Constitution. The Swiss people and in 1999, voted a new constitution, it wasn't a revolution, but our values are set out very clearly. And those are the values which have now brutally been violated by this uh, Russian invasion. Our values have been breached and trampled, so it's normal that Switzerland's reaction should be absolutely crystal clear when it comes to this violation of public international law. That indeed is our the way we as a country can survive thanks to this international law. And geographically, we are located in the middle of the Alps and surrounded by large, major historical countries. Yeah, I don't need to tell you about France and Germany and the past, their monarchies and the powerful position of Italy, even when it was a Roman empire. The fact that we exist, that Switzerland exists, is because we're neutral and because the countries surrounding us needed this buffer zone uh, between them and the Alps and between themselves so as not to have direct contact. So I don't know whether this is a blessing from God. Perhaps it's because we're more beautiful or handsome. I don't know. In any case, it's a product of history. And I often tend to say that politics and geography Tell me where you live. Tell me where you grew up. We were just, I just mentioned Italy. Italy goes from the Alps, covered by eternal snow, all the way down to Sicily, right in the middle of the Mediterranean. And Germany is flat almost from one side to the other. And that makes for very different minds and different ways of functioning. So, yes, Switzerland is neutral. Ever since the beginning of hostilities between Russia and Ukraine in 2014, when the Crimea was uh, annexed, we have used that neutrality. And we have, furthermore, we have clearly reinforced our sanctions. We adopted the European Union sanctions. The object of the exercise being to be part of a large family of nations, to ensure that these sanctions really have an impact. Even the most stringent sanctions are to no avail if they only can affect the production of 8 million people. That's nothing compared to the Russian bear, the Russian bear whom we want to strike hard so as to put an end to this war. That's the situation of Switzerland. I'd like to add a question to what you just said, Mr. President. Why is there such a debate about neutrality policy in Switzerland and abroad following the sanctions imposed by Switzerland on Russia, is it not an opportunity to really decide exactly what constitutes neutrality? What neutrality is, is something that happens along the, the, on the road. You live your life according to what happens along the way. Read, read the, his, the historical lexicon of Switzerland. A, it's called the historical lexicon of Switzerland. Read the chapter written by Professor Ricklin on Switzerland's neutrality. That's one of the first things I read right at the outset to see what the historical facts are. And you'll see that Switzerland is the home of fine watchmaking. I use that word because the president of Croatia mentioned our watchmaking technicians, they work with great precision. So, and then if you look at that, you see First World War, Second World War, the Franco-German War. We have always 
We Swiss have always been involved in precision watchmaking. In other words, we've adapted reality to the specific circumstances. Neutrality policy is the body of political decisions a country takes in order to make its legal neutrality credible and reflect it in its foreign policy. That's the tool Switzerland has. It's what m gives us security and stability in this world, and it's the reason why Switzerland is still exists. I have a question, Mr. President. Picking up on the theme of collective security, what do you think about the Budapest Memorandum? Do you, does it reassure you? I mean, do you think it's good to think that? Is it is it reassuring to think that such a huge security institution in Europe was not complied with? Do you think that it will have an impact on your view on security in Europe? Switzerland is not a world military power. Certainly not. Our security is built on international law. Law protects the weakest, and that stands to reason. The force of law is alpha and omega for us. For other larger countries, it's might that's right, but we're protected by law. We need a strong international system, and that's why multilateralism is so important. That's why we wanted the United Nations after the, first world, the Second World War. It's to give stability, to ensure that the atrocities of war that we saw in the Second World War are not repeated. We didn't see those atrocities, fortunately, but our parents and grandparents did. And the hope was that with this multilateral order and international law, we would be forever protected against atrocities. And now, brutally, we have seen what can happen for the past two or three Three, two or three days, there has been a, 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 a tide shift in Europe. Things, will, Nothing will ever be the way it was before. Nothing will ever be the same again. We have to rebuild a security architecture in Europe. Rebuild it. And there's going to be a lot of discussion on European Union security autonomy. Can the European Union still claim to enjoy protection of NATO, a transatlantic alliance under the, Europe, uh, under the Americans' leadership, or can one say that there can be no future for the European Union unless it has its own security force? These are fundamental issues which are all bubbling to the surface. The European Union is big enough and it's very complex. It has all sorts of internal structures. I think the time has come for the European Union to say perhaps we need to think about our security in independent terms and not always rely on assistance from the United States. I'm convinced that this question will come up. And uh, where will this question come up? Until now, we had the European for Security and Cooperation Europe, the OSCE. That's of paramount importance in Switzerland. We were co-creators of this organization. And as it, luck would have it, in the second half of last year, I said to our diplomats, let's do something about reinforcing this organization. I couldn't help feeling that it was slowly but surely falling into paralysis. At the time, it was, and now I think it is paralyzed. I agree with you. Have you heard about the OSCE in the past two months? Have we heard anything about it? And yet that is the organization, the origins of uh, security in Switzerland since the Stockholm Declaration. So the question is, can we assume that we will rely on the OSCE to redefine a new security architecture for Europe, or else we'll have to think up something new. 
EU, which doesn't exist yet. And we would be happy to go along with any solution because we are convinced that we need a proper security architecture for this continent of ours. Madame Calmiret. Well, it's not only a problem for the European continent. The world order is concerned by the Security Council. Let's face it, the Security Council is supposed to promote peace and security throughout the world. And not only now in the war in Ukraine, we've seen when other conflicts occurred that the United Nations is focusing on climate change and humanitarian, humanitarian aid. But when it comes to security, the Security Council has no teeth. And that worries small countries like us, Switzerland and Croatia. There's this erosion of uh, multilateralism that we are witnessing. And I'd ask both of you, President Milanovic and President Cassis, aren't you scared too? Aren't you worried about your security and the fact that uh, multilateral organizations are proving to be powerless in a situation of war? Well, I kind of addressed this question a short while ago whether we, we, we feel an inequity or, or concern or, or uneasiness about our security. I don't think we do, we don't. Because we are harbored, like in the uteral sense, in the, in the safe core of Europe at this point. Uh, all the calamities and troubles and fears and grievances of the yesteryear are now bygone and we are living normal lives. Whether this could spill over to Croatia, theoretically, yes. In practice, no. But you have mentioned the Budapest yes. Protocol of 94. Well, that's, that's another, you know, uh, display of, well, I have to put it this way, cynicism in international politics. I, I recall those years, 94, I think I was exactly here in this city when the memorandum, short of formal international legal instrument, not duly ratified, not fully complying to the standards of international of Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties was adopted and I was here. And I remember talking to the Russian and Ukrainian diplomats of the day. Russians, you know, watching their president of the day, a booth hunter drinking himself to death, Boris Yeltsin. They were a joke, actually. And nobody took them really seriously at the time. They were out of the wounds from the Chechen conflict, first, first Chechen war. And then that memorandum, which everybody, everybody applauded, so it's great. Well, when you ask Americans these days, they will tell you that it doesn't constitute a guarantee because actually it's not a, it's not a pure legal form. When you ask Russians, they would probably, albeit I haven't heard them uttering such a phrase, they would probably say that there is an application of the clause Rebus Six Stantibus, the things as, as, as stand right now, and the circumstances have changed. So they are entitled to disregard the purported guarantees that, 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 that were kind of mentioned in that memorandum. So, so much about international law. That's something that I've been by training, international lawyer. And when I lost faith, I not exactly converted, but I became more realistic. So we can only, you know, cross ourselves and, 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 and complain and note cynicism, but it worked, and then the circumstances changed, and the Russians, they emerged in a different form after 25 years, and it's, as Mr. President Cassis said, geopolitics, and it's nasty business. It's nasty business. Whether we feel safe. I've been rather skeptical of that culture of safetyism, which, which prevails over American campuses, at least. Are you safe? Are you offended? Did anybody give you a bad look? On a, can you sleep, you know? Did your nanny take care of you? Well, li life is sometimes rush. And we that emerged from the wartime know better. So there is no absolute safety. One looking for that is in the, in the, in the, in the, in the wrong business. Uh, our neighbors should be dealt with. When I say dealt with, not subjected, not humiliated, because it never, it never yields a sweet fruits, being engaged, that's a word that I, that, that, that I like very much in the vocabulary of international relations, to engage somebody. It has a, a couple of meanings. So Serbia should be engaged. 
and not actually blackmailed, not put before the ultimatum, but look, you want to live normal lives? You really want to emerge from the, from the debilitating status of the lower middle income countries for decades because you knew better, Croatia knew better. Croatia, the living standard in the western parts of Croatia during Yugoslavia was out par with living standard of Sicily. Mr. President made some references to the geography of Italy. So we knew better. After all, we emerged triumphant out of this war, but the price for Croatia was terrible, terrible. Generations to bear it, to end. I was a law student in 1990, and we participated as a team guided and streamlined by the law professors from Zagreb University, Europe, prominent Europe-wide. And it was still Yugoslav state, and we were second biggest city in Yugoslavia, and the oldest university. So we would stand for Yugoslavia at the Moot Court competition in The Hague before the International Court of Justice, administered by the Leiden University Telders competition. The lawyers, if there are any, should know that. And it was really exclusive, and we were the only ones from Eastern Europe. No Czechs, no Hungarians, no Poles, no nobody else. Just Western Yugoslavia, Zagreb standing and, uh, for Yugoslavia. It was April 1990. April, I was 23 at the time. So my expectation was not war. My expectation was that stupid politicians would somehow cut the deal, and then we roll. You know, we become members of the European community of the day. Our living standards uh, explode. Actually, the average salary in Croatia in April 1990 was in the neighborhood of 1,000 Deutsche Mark. It's some money. I mean, it was real money. In two years, myself, some colleagues of mine in the audience, now my associates, friends, advisors, we were receiving 200 Deutsche Mark per month. So it collapsed economically. So, and this is a kind of freedom, but not in the sense of the, of the song of, of, of Janis Joplin that freedom is another word for nothing left to lose. <laughs> there is much to lose, though. Thank you. Eh? <laughs> Monsieur le Président Cassis. President Cassis, on the subject of multilateralism, you say that Switzerland relies on the force of law for its security. Uh, how reassuring is that? Well, you can see that we follow the same line. We know what our possibilities are. We need law. We, can, we have no other stronger tools or instruments to guide us. I fully agree that the United Nations Security Council at the moment is completely blocked. One of the five permanent men members of the Security Council has the right of veto. So everything has come to a standstill. But that's nothing new. It's been going on for years. For years, there's been a discussion at international level about this body, which after all is the most important body of the United Nations, and which has lost credibility has lost its impact. They still manage to run peacekeeping uh, missions in some African countries which aren't politically linked to any other countries on the planet, which is not a bad thing, but that's not exactly the striking force we expect of the Security Council. And any attempts to reform the Security Council has failed because no one is prepared to give up power, not you or I or the Security Council in the United Nations. No one wants to lose power. So I wonder in these recent weeks whether this break, this whether this is not something which is going to relaunch the discussion, but properly. You, you need violence for there to be a change in the Security Council. It is not going to happen without violence. Uh, we don't know when this war will be over, but perhaps this war is what's going to cause a break in the international order built after the Second World War, 75 years ago, and perhaps that is what's going to signal a new start. Clément, I think you had a question as well. 
Thank you. Yes, uh, President Cassis, President Milanovic, you talked about breaks and changes. After the war, or uh, since this invasion and the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia, uh, there's a question, sorry, I, I want to ask a question about resources, all the resources that we buy, gas, oil. Do you think that this is going to bring about change in your countries? Do you think in the short term or in the long term it's going to be possible to completely rethink the way in which we manage such resources and move away from dependence on Russia, find uh, other sources of these resources? Thank you very much. Well, the, even before this war, the Federal Council has decided to reduce reliance on fossil fuels because of uh, the need for carbon neutrality in 2030, and that's going to take time. Obviously, this war has added a security dimension to the climate challenge, which means we have to step up our efforts, and the Federal Council has already done that. In, to some extent, a federal ordinance was issued uh, two weeks ago, which uh, provides incentives for greater, extent, more extensive use of renewable energies, thermic uh, and photovoltaic energy to produce electricity. So yes, indeed, the climate transition, which we've already embarked upon, don't forget that we have to deal with the climate change crisis as well. And I think it has accelerated, has speeded things up, and has triggered a move to move away from the energy dependence we have on Russia. The president of Croatia made the point very clearly. If you look at a map, you look at the size of Russia. Russia has endless power, endless force. We can do what we like, but we'll never measure up to that size. It's a matter of a power balance. We have to simply try and get away from this dependence and uh, become as independent as possible. That doesn't come free of charge. There's a price. And we're already beginning to see indirect repercussions in Switzerland. The price of gas and petrol is going up. The European Union is engaged in very tough negotiations. They're going to put in place a fifth bundle of sanctions, which will affect uh, coal. They have not yet gone to the point of doing without Russian gas and oil. Here we are in this uh, auditorium talking and talking, talking about problems. And after lunch and after having a good sleep in a warm house, we obviously would not be the same if our essential vital needs were not satisfied. So in the Western democracies, we have to also find a, moder a, a, a measure of change which is acceptable in our democratic societies. Thank you, Mr. President. I think the time has now come for a question and answer session for everyone in the auditorium. There are roving microphones going around. Before you ask your question, would you please introduce yourself, stand up and introduce yourself. Thank you. I can't see a thing, says Madame Calmiret, so do stand up. We're blinded by the light, so if you want a microphone, you want to put a question, make sure that somebody sees you. So uh, thank you, Mr. Milanovic and Mr. Cassis, for being here today. Uh, so my name is David. I'm uh, studying the international relations, second year of bachelor. I'm 20 years old. Uh, I, I thank you very, I thank you both very much today for uh, for being here in our university. Uh, I was I, have, I was having a question about another conflict that occurred a few, one two years ago around. Uh, so I was wondering why didn't Switzerland or Croatia? I'm also addressing you as a, a EU member state. Uh, why didn't uh, reduce its dependency on, uh, for example, Azeri oil? during the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, where similar war crimes as uh, similar war crimes were committed that are not committed in Russia. Beheadings, 
cluster munition weapons, white phosphorus. Those are the war crime, uh, those are things, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit stressed. Uh, so Russia is committing war crime right now and it's being heavily condemned and sanctioned for that. While uh, Azerbaijan committed similar war crimes in Nagorno-Karabakh against ethnic Armenians. Why weren't similar sanctions taken? Against whom? Against Azerbaijan. Uh, yeah, first? Begin. <laughs> uh, well, believe it or not, but the, my, my real diplomatic career was triggered in uh, late May 94. I was idling for the most part in Geneva, pretending working something while actually working nothing, attending a conference, and then the phone rang, and the ambassador of Croatia to Vienna, to the Conference for the Security and Cooperation in Europe, still not on an organization, it was triggered only in December that year, gave me a ring. He is a, he's a husband of the current Croatian ambassador to Switzerland, sitting right here. He's been retired. And he told me, look, you're going to go to Stockerau, Vienna. It's at the outskirts. That's where many Croatian uh, legionaries in the 19th century and my relatives too were dispatched from to the war fronts of Europe. And you're going to spend some time there and they're going to dispatch you for, to Nagorno-Karabakh, Azerbaijan. And it really happened. So I was the first Croatian diplomat ever confined to some diplomatic mission. I was traded, I was commodity because I had some command of Russian language, actually better than anybody in my generation in Croatia. And that was what made me tradable. After all, I first traveled home to Zagreb from Stokerau, where I slept on the floor, and then ended up in nagorno karabakh So I know place well. Actually, I was always almost killed in the minefield in 94. Because it's just totally messy and unorganized. Now, you're referring to the war crimes committed by, purportedly, I'm quoting your words, by Azerbaijan in the, in the, in the bygone, in, in the last war of liberation, as they label it, well, I have a trouble, you know, label it that way. As well as I have a trouble label it anything that hasn't been properly investigated because I came from the culture and of cultural of war when everybody was labeled and, 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 and called names. So uh, I witnessed atro atrocities, uh, breaches of law standards by both sides back then. But then Armenians had upper hand. And until the very present day, I remained a kind of neutral on that topic because I had understanding for both. You know, departing from the history and the context in, in which Nagorno-Karabakh actually was uh, uh, a toy in the hands of Stalin at the time, because there were expectations that Turkey would become Soviet Republic, and then it had direct reflection on the shape of the territory of the new republics. So that's how Azerbaijan ended up with the exclave of Nakhchevan. There is a lot to read about it. Mm -hmm. And then Azerbaijan triggered a war of liberation at a point when they felt strong enough and emboldened by Turkey. And as the, your French language saying goes, l'appétit vient à manger, they went more and more, and then Russian came and stopped them. And it's, but we are talking two small countries, like Croatia and Serbia, you know, blown out of proportion. So let's, let's not exaggerate when we label, because my nation, Croat, has been labeled by Serb nationalists as genocidal. Croats labeled Serbs, I'm Croat, as genocidal. Bosniak Muslims, Bosniaks, label Serb as genocidal on the account of Srebrenica for certain reasons, grounded. But then again, what about Holocaust? Mm -hmm. Should we recalibrate the, 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 the total toponymy of, uh, and taxonomy of the, of the language in the international criminal law? Because not everything qualifies to be labeled as a genocide. Not everything is a war crime. And to end, to bring this too close, 
hundreds of civilians were murdered and slit throats, with slit throats in, in, in Croatia in, the, in 91. Neighbor on neighbor, of a kind that we haven't witnessed yet in Ukraine, whatever happened in Bucha. But in Croatia, it was killing, you know. Uh, at, a, at, a, at a bullet range, and it was terrible, because it drew on the, on the wars and grievances and atrocities of the past, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Uh, without conclusion, yeah. inconclusive. So, uh, the things that I want, I want, I don't like to hurt at the account and at the expense of my nation, because after all, or before I'm a crowd, I don't want to direct towards others. Mm -hmm. Because I see it around, I hear it, you know. Serbs are genocidal, this is genocidal. Yeah. Well, the, the only genuine genocide that I really witnessed was against the Jewish people, people in the World War II, and another one in Central Africa, in Rwanda. And the others are terrible atrocities. So let's preserve dignity of those victims. Because it's not the same, you know, Jewish conflict being put in the gun in, 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 in a trail car and driven from Thessaloniki or Budapest, for that matter, in the very last months of the war to Auschwitz and uh, some other murders which, no matter how horrid they are, are debatably genocidal. Let's be conservative on that. President Assis. Oui. <coughs> Alors, Je pourrais ne rien Thank dire you. I could not say anything, not add anything, because I agree 100% with what my colleague from Croatia has just said. But I will say something, because I think we need to be consistent. Before, we talked about international war, uh, international law, and I said that it's the law that makes us strong, not force or violence. For some time now, we've been living in a rather strange situation. The best politician in Switzerland is the one who uses labels and toughest labels, puts the toughest labels on images that people put onto the social media, and you don't know where they came from, you don't know how they've been manipulated. And I have to steer a very careful line, a very sober line, I say it's normal to have strong emotions, to feel scandal, to suffer at the things we see, but you still have to establish truth and the facts before you talk about war crimes or genocide. It's not a label, it's not a sort of political beauty contest and you to use those labels. These names mean something. You need independent international tribunals. It will be their duty with our money and your money uh, to pay them to investigate the facts and the truth and come up with a final judgment. So let us preserve some decorum and be not lose our minds. There's a grave threat here, as I see it. If we if we give way and follow this uh, emotional tendency and uh, become, th then we'll end up with a Twitter community and Instagram community deciding whether somebody has killed someone or not. We can't let the social media be carried away with our emotions in that way. Do we want to live in a country that's ruled by the state of law? We all are overcome by emotions. I saw it myself when I went to, went to see refugees at the border. But still, we have to remain strict and rigorous. We live in a society which has mechanisms that we have put in place to establish facts and truth, and we must use them. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question. 
Introduce yourself, please, and speak into a microphone. Bonjour, uh, je suis Good Eva, afternoon, Master, I'm Eva. I start, I'm engaged in African Studies it, at Geneva University. You mentioned a change in the international order a moment ago, and I'd like to ask you something about international cooperation and the idea of a new international order. Don't you think we should revise the current order and give more thought to emerging countries countries in Africa and Asia and Latin America and give uh, stop always putting Western the Western world at the center of the world. Thank you. What you have just said is perfectly rational. If you look at the map and you look at them, you'll see that the map of the world is not the same today as it was in 1945. The United Nations and their bodies represent the world order that existed in 1945, but you can't just change that overnight. It's something that's a bit more difficult than that. Uh, we have tried many different approaches to bring about a change in the world order, and we haven't managed. And I said sometimes a violent break is what is needed to produce a new start, something that really breaks the old order so that one can start off on a new world order which doesn't reflect the situation 75 years ago. arrangements are always made in the aftermath of the greatest calamities, wars. And until further calamity of, of that kind, of that magnitude, this is what we have and which will continue to be jealously guarded by the beneficiaries. And those are Russia, still a great power, China, a greater power, the US, the greatest power, but quite seldom willing to commit herself to the ground war. Uh, and then France and uh, UK, which are not of that class anymore, with all due respect, for France in particular. And then the others lurking from behind. And I cannot but recall mid-90s when the, that glorious discussion of the reform of the UN Security Council started, you know, and we're going to have India in Brazil, you know, Croatia, Moldova is a permanent member, you know. And it was so childish and so ridiculous and ludicrous because that's what is so jealously and selfishly guarded. And it can be remade only after, you know, greatest trauma. So it's mostly unfunctional. It's, it's, for some, it's a laughing stock, but it's the lowest common denominator. So when they push out Russia from the Human Rights Council, well, maybe they deserve that, but they're a permanent council member. So that's what we got. <laughs> that's reality. I'm, and I'm Atlantic realist of sorts, not fully. And uh, I don't know whether, you, whether it's, it fell out of vogue or it's still fashionable to read geopolitics because those thinkers and writers are very nasty people. Some were Nazi supporters like Carl Schmitt of Germany. Then it's Haushofer who exonerated himself from, from Nazis in a matter of months, but those people removed, malicious parts removed. What remains is, is, is a food for deep thought, how they viewed world politics, geography and politics, what President mentioned a couple of times today. He was not induced by me, it came spontaneously from you. Ratzel, Haushofer, I mentioned, Kellen, those are not good guys but they should be paid attention to, because what we are watching these days, removed of all ethics, is a bare geopolitics. Russia is not democracy. It's not a country to be measured by the yardstick we measured, for God's, for heaven's sake, we do, each other's. Switzerland being crazy rich, Croatia being middle income, higher middle income, almost developed economy, but it's different standard. It's different standard. And for, for the end, I implore or call upon uh, commission and all those bureaucratic uh, brilliant minds to recognize the fact that there are several nations in Europe, that there is not much bringing close apart from the membership in the same framework 
institutional framework, Portuguese and Finnish, because they couldn't be more different. That there are national prides and prejudices which live within the people, among the people, and uh, result in a defensive and offensive outbursts. Say Hungary. I mean, I was perplexed by the Hungarian, you know, political mindset of last decade, but it's there. And ha happily, it hasn't hurt anybody physically. It's not a matter of sympathy or antipathy or, or, or my uh, affiliation towards that. It's not my way, but we can still live together. Saying that, we cannot live together under the same umbrella with Russia, but it's going to be next to you. And you better watch out that your umbrella doesn't uh, pick in your eye and the other way around. That's, that's what counts. So I was detached. I never, I actually never met Putin. I was always totally, you know, skeptical towards Russians of newer generation. I barely mingled with Ukrainians either. And I'm saying only that is within my paycheck and it's low. Hello. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Ça, ça... Et merci à vous, les étudiants. Merci à vous Thank tous you, présents ici. all you, the students who are here with us today. I now give the floor to Professor Levra, who is head of the Global Studies Institute and who was good enough to organize this meeting. Thank you very much indeed, Madam. Thank you to both presidents and also thank you to the students, those on the podium, but also the ones in the audience. And I'd also like to thank the teachers who teach this uh, course on introduction to international relations who included this meeting in their curriculum. I think we've had a very interesting experience here for those on the podium and the others as well. It's a dialogue which goes beyond our community in which we have special functions. You have dialogues as heads of state, which is only normal, and you as students studying international relations, you uh, study matters uh, concerning the relations between states. And here you see not only the people who are at the head of these states, but also the people who are learning about all that, meeting together, and this produces a sort of exchange and a form of knowledge, which I think is quite original. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. I think this type of dialogue is extremely constructive, not only dialogue between different sectors, but also between different disciplines. Your course is an interdisciplinary one, and I couldn't help noticing that both presidents mentioned international law in different contexts, but also the fundamentals of international uh, politics and international relations. Uh, realism is gaining new ground. We've also had reference to the international economy, which plays a key role, as you said, Mr. President, in all these developments. And the history of neutrality was also mentioned. So even when you're a politician, you don't focus only on politics. You have to be concerned by all the dimensions of of the situation. And thank you for having put this message across to our students. Geneva, where this bilateral dialogue has taken place, but Geneva is also the capital of multilateralism. As you know, we've talked about the future of multilateralism and the hopes for a new world order, and we certainly have the ardent hope that your generation, uh, in a few years' time, we hope that your generation will get to work and build this new security architecture. And don't forget get this beautiful concept of neutrality when you're doing it. Thank you all very much indeed. Before I close, a practical point. Could you please be good enough to remain seated for a minute or two to allow the presidents and their delegations to leave the room? And then afterwards, you can all go out unless, of course, your teachers want to say something. No, in that case, that's the end of uh, this uh, event. <laughs>